Our God, we are grateful to be here, to think, study, to have fellowship, to think again about our mission in the world. May you inspire us to do what is right, to do what is just, and to do what is loving. Help us to realize that we live in a lost world where people desperately need to know and receive the gospel. Give us the wherewithal to do that with all of our might. In Christ's name, amen. The title of my message is Apologetics and Art. And I can't see the clock, so I'm going to take my watch off. You always want the speaker to see the clock. It's very important. Apologetics and Art. And I have a quote from Francis Schaeffer. With truth comes beauty, and with this beauty, a freedom before God. Let's think about where we are. We are in the greater Denver area. We're at a conference called For the City. And in light of what has been said, we are for the city with the knowledge of God. Now that shows us that we are responsible to make the gospel known. We have the knowledge of God revealed in Scripture. We've been given intellectual tools to make it known, to understand our culture, Western civilization, law. Well, where are we? We are in an artful city. We are in an art-filled city. It's cosmopolitan, in some areas somewhat or excessively bohemian. However, the percentage of those that attend churches is very low. In fact, I think many people's religion in this area would be uh, football or art or the outdoors, but not worshiping the one true God. We live in a scene where there is a tremendous amount of culture in painting, the plastic arts. We have a whole variety of galleries on Santa Fe in the art district. Denver Seminary itself has a gallery in one of our rooms, one of our buildings, that brings in art from all over the local area. We have a very, to lapse into jazz bow language, a hip and groovy jazz scene. We have a, one of the best jazz clubs in the country called Dazzle Jazz. We have others. We have nationally known performers coming in, excellent local groups. So we have an artful and art-filled, cosmopolitan, somewhat bohemian, unchurched city. Now, beyond the human art that we see through human culture, we also see the divine art with the, the many moods of our mountains. Mountain climbing, hiking, the aspens in the fall. A lot of people would give a tremendous amount to look out the window and see what we see right now. God's handiwork. Now, in light of where we are, Greater Denver area, for the city, with the background knowledge we've been given so far, I want to consider the role of art in apologetics under several topics. First of all, briefly, I want to give an argument called the argument from beauty to God, or the aesthetic argument. Then discuss the art of apologetics, discussing primarily rhetoric, and then show some paintings of a French mid, early to mid-century painter that illustrates the poignancy of the human condition. And this art, in a sense, is an apologetic for Christianity. Let me start with the argument from beauty to God. This is under the argument from design family of arguments for God's existence. You go from the cosmos as a whole or part of the cosmos to saying that God is the best explanation for what in fact is here and is better than the explanation given by atheism or pantheism or Islam 
or some other worldview. This is called natural theology, and natural theology is a part of the discipline called apologetics, which I understand to mean the defense of the Christian worldview as compellingly rational, objectively true, and pertinent to the whole of life. I'm only going to outline this argument. In some circles, especially in contemporary Protestant circles, this argument is neglected. However, the argument appeals very deeply to our sensibilities because we are moved by art in many ways. Whether or not you have a theory of art or you can technically define what beautiful means, pretty difficult, we are moved, we are affected by forms of art. We may weep, we may get goosebumps, we may get nauseous. I'm not gonna give the argument from nausea to God right now. I'm, I'm still working on that argument, actually. Just thought of it. <laughs> <clears throat> so let me give you the outline of this argument. And in my big apologetics book, Christian Apologetics, and we have my books on sale for a discount, I don't deal with this argument. And if we have another edition, just to make it a little longer, uh, I'll probably include it. It's 752 pages. It can also be used as a doorstop, <laughs> my students tell me. All right, here's the first premise. There are objects and events that display objective beauty. Casting the net very broadly here. There are objects and events that display objective beauty. Now, first of all, you have to challenge what's called aesthetic relativism, or beauty is only in the eye of the beholder. Dr. DeWeese talked about this. Yes, beauty may be in the eye of the beholder, but it's not only there. It's also in what is beheld. Moreover, you can make mistakes in aesthetic judgments. You could call something beautiful that is ugly, ugly that is beautiful. So we need to make the case that there are such things as objective aesthetic qualities or properties. The best argument I've seen for this is, and tying it into the moral values, is the abolition of man, C.S. Lewis, book one. Many other arguments. Now, what do we have to appeal to if we can make some kind of case that there are elements or there are examples of objective beauty in the world? Part of this is simply by giving examples or as saying that we know the music of Bach is more complex and harmonious and pleasing than, uh, let's say, a death metal group. Sorry to offend you death metal fans, but you're probably not here anyway. <laughs> um, we can make those kind of comparisons with vivid examples. So let's make that assumption. What can we appeal to? We can talk about beauty from the human hearts and minds and hands and voices. Beauty that we see, or intense aesthetic meaning, may not always be beautiful, may be a little upsetting, but it still grabs us and makes us think and listen and look more intently. I think we may be thinking of painting, oils, watercolors, sculpture, poetry, prose, works of fiction, music, jazz, dance, architecture, jewelry, and so on. Or we could be thinking about natural beauty, beauty that no human being designed or created, such as the, the different views of the mountains and certain animals and fish that are so brightly and amazingly colored. We look at these things and we say something is calling out to us and it's more than what chemistry, biology, and physics can say. You can assess these things in those terms. You could talk about the chemical composition of a saxophone or the biological details of the saxophonist, but you can't explain the artistic qualities that come out of a skilled saxophonist 
playing in those reductionistic kind of ways. There's something more than just those natural properties. Now, the second stage of the argument is that these elements of beauty and artistic qualities cannot be adequately explained by naturalism or pantheism or postmodernism. That is, the best explanation for these episodes of aesthetic experience where we recognize something objectively compelling and beautiful, the best explanation is that we are creatures made in God's image, put in a world that has created and designed beauty, and that we can recognize these things, and by recognizing them or by producing them, we are involved in a transcendent dimension. We're not simply talking about chemistry, biology, and physics. We are involved in that world of space-time history, certainly. But there is something greater that may cause us to become silent, to gasp, to try to find adequate words of praise for this painting or this animal. For example, I often attend Dazzle for jazz concerts, and I went to a marvelous concert by the clarinetist and saxophonist Annette Cohen, and it was delightful on every level in terms of the excellent solos, the group improvisation, the communication, the interplay, the, instrument, the musicians listening to the other instruments, that's called having big ears and then responding to it. And I talked to the band leader, Annette Cohen, and there weren't too many people around. Dazzle is a small venue where you can talk to people pretty easily. And I said, you were really in the flow tonight. Everybody was just in the groove. And she said, yes, after a while, you don't even have to think much about it. That there's something going on that's bigger than any one of us. And I said, there's no place for ego, was there? And she said, no. And then I said, would you like to accept Christ? No, it didn't quite get that far. <laughs> but do you see what I'm saying? There's something magical about great art. Musicians can feel it. The participants in the audience, in a sense, can feel it and participate vicariously and ex experience that thrill, that joy. I think this is an argument that needs more development. J.P. Moreland has developed it, I think, in two of his books. Uh, the Roman Catholic tradition has done more work on this, I think, historically, and evangelicals have a lot to learn in that area. But, you see, you can help reinterpret the world for someone who is not a Christian. You can say, what happened to you when you heard that great opera, when there was a silence after it? What happens when you hear the Hallelujah Chorus? Is it only the events in an unguided, undirected, materialistic world with no God, no designer, and we are simply evolved animals, and the only thing that really matters is survival? Is that the way to interpret and really to feel those kind of events in light of those objects and activities? No, it isn't. Will this argument get you all the way to the gospel? No, but it's part of a cumulative case for Christian theism. And it helps dethrone a materialistic, or for that matter, pantheistic view. In the pantheistic view, everything is divine, and most forms of pantheism say everything is one. And so the world of particular things, of beauty, of compelling art, just melts into this faceless one divinity. So pantheism cannot explain it. I don't think naturalism can explain it. What explains this is the divine artist. Now, of course, we find ugliness in the world. But Christianity has an explanation for that as well, and that is the space-time fall, that things were tarnished and marred, but not so much as to destroy the elements of beauty and aesthetic worth in our world. That's a brief summary. Let me now talk about the art of apologetics, and here I'm dealing with the study of rhetoric. 
Rhetoric is the art of persuasion. We often hear rhetoric used in a very pejorative sense, as in the political rhetoric, the talking points. Or we hear the words mere rhetoric. Well, I want to use it in the classical sense. We already had Aristotle quoted. Aristotle wrote a book called Rhetoric. And one can go much deeper into this. However, let me limit this to three essential elements of the, the art and logic of persuasion. And that is logos, ethos, and pathos. Logos has to do with the logic of the argument that you are presenting. It has to do with clarity, defining terms, specifying the kind of argument form that you're using, anticipating rebuttal, responding to rebuttal, having a knowledge of what the basic issues are with respect to what you're arguing. This has to do with intellectual competence, which comes out of your native ability, your time of study, preparation, and the work of the Holy Spirit, all together. Now, we should be interested in Lagos since our Lord is called the Lagos. The beginning was the Word, the Logos. The Word was with God and the Word was God, and all things were made through Him. So Christ holds the world together and provides the intelligibility we need for art and science. And Dr. Deweese mentioned some of those conditions for science. We can apply that to the arts as well. And I think of this text, Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. God came in Christ to take away your sins, not take away your mind. I'm sure everybody here is in agreement with that. But if we're going to defend Christianity as objectively true, compellingly rational, and pertinent to the whole of life, we need to know what we're talking about. We need to study significantly. We should, God helping us, outthink the world for Christ. Now that takes discipline. Requires, as JP said, reading. As Frank said, silence. The desire to learn about history and basic logic and rhetoric and so on. And this means we are going to be different from the majority of Americans who spend tremendous amount of times in front of screens and not reading Aristotle and usually not reading the Bible or reading basic logic. We need time to hunker down with books. Remember books? <laughs> Put away the screens, read the book, reread, read slowly, annotate, memorize. We should be people who are invested in the book of books, the Holy Scriptures, and who are knowledgeable of a lot of books and information that people are ignorant about, like Western civilization and what made it what it is in so many ways, as, as Dr. DeWeese argued. We need to be able to refute the person who says if science doesn't prove it, it can't be real. Science is the only way to know truth, or science is the best way to know anything. We need some study. We need the knowledge to communicate that. But that's not enough. That's necessary. That's not sufficient for the art of apologetics. The second feature is ethos, which has to do really with ethics and the character of the person presenting the arguments. Because profound arguments can be presented in ways that turn off an audience, or in ways that unnecessarily offend or bore the person you're speaking with. So we want people to listen to us because we have something to say, and just because we think we have something significant to offer doesn't mean other people will. 
So we need to develop a bearing, a character. That is, we have a character to love truth, to be earnest, to be truth seekers, to be studious, not just curious, but studious, to know the things that matter most, to apply to human flourishing to the glory of God. So anytime you, you speak in a group like this, or just one-on-one, -on -one, or a small group, or post something on a blog, whatever it is, ask this question. Why should anyone listen to what you have to say? People don't immediately think they need to know what you know. So you need to have that character, that bearing, the ethos, to rightly come across. Then you can ask the question, are you believable? It's one thing to get people to listen to you, to stop twitching and chattering and texting, and actually listen to you. But then, do you have the right to be there? Are you saying anything believable? Anything credible? Well, then you go back to Logos. You have to study. And then you study how to present yourself, not to manipulate people. We're not talking about propaganda. But as JP said, you develop these habits that become formed into a character. So you have the tendency to be generous, to be truth-seeking, to be loving, to be patient and kind and not arrogant and boastful and put other people first such that you don't have to win every argument and have the last word. So we need to work on our ethos in apologetics. Summarize it, developing godly character. We need love and wisdom along with truth and logos. Thirdly, we need pathos. And I always think of Jeremiah on this, where Jeremiah had the toughest ministry, really, you can imagine, outside of Christ. No one believed him, yet he was called to prophesy. He was persecuted. And Jeremiah, in chapter 20, verse 9, said, I wanted to hold back the message, but I could not, because it was fire in my bones, and it had to come out. And we need that kind of fire in our bones. Not to be showy, bombastic, but to show that we care about the people to whom we are speaking or writing, that this is an act of love. We're trying to present truth in such a way that it becomes knowledge about the things that matter most in the world. So that means we study hard, love God with your heart, soul, strength, and mind, love your neighbor as yourself. So study, develop character, within the church, the sacred patterns of the church, in community, through study of scripture, prayer, spiritual disciplines, and ask God to give you the right orientation to what Schaefer called the watching world, the world of non-Christians, watching, observing Christians. And in our case, it's often not the watching world, but the snickering world, or the sneering world. You people have faith, well, we know we have knowledge by science. Well, I hope you see by now, that's not true, but it's a popular belief. So by pathos, I don't mean emotional manipulation. I do not mean putting on airs that are not authentically who you are. But you ask the Lord, you ask the Holy Spirit, who's the spirit of truth, to work in you and through you such that you refract the character of God through your, your own unique personality. So pathos, caring, loving, listening. This is how I summarize the rhetoric, the rhetorical art of apologetics. We need knowledge in our heads, fire in our bones, and love in our hearts. Now furthermore, this is a more general concept, we need to aim for eloquence. Now this is not needed because Paul apparently was not an eloquent speaker. But look at how powerfully God used him. But nevertheless, we should aim to be as clear, as concise, and as persuasive as we can. 
using a whole variety of tools in terms of developing our speaking abilities. And Christians need to think more about this. That is, developing your resources of communicating, developing your speaking voice, being very finicky about the proper use of terms, grammar. You notice how JP corrected the grammar of the quote he was reading? JP actually advocates correcting the grammar of the people you're talking to. I'm still praying about that. I, I do that sometimes in my classes, which means you can correct mine. But we want to be eloquent without being egotistical or showy. It's not, look at me, what a rhetorical superstar I am. But you don't want the medium of your personality to hinder the beauty of the message. So that means you want to think well, feel what you ought to feel, know how to communicate in particular settings, a setting like this, on a radio program, whatever it is. I was on a radio program Tuesday to talk about Rod Dreher's new book, The Benedict Option, which I highly recommend, and what Frank was recently saying just a few minutes ago about community and the sacred and so on, is very significant to our identity. But when I'm on the radio, I have about 12 minutes in any given segment. Frank knows this, you've been on so many radio shows. So you have to adopt a rhetorical strategy for radio. And it's not the same one as we have here. If you write a letter to the editor, you must not go over the word length. I don't care who you are, you must not. You hear this, this is a moral absolute. <laughs> I teach a class on writing for publication. You write the word limit. I had an article, rather a letter published in the New York Times Book Review recently. 112 words, I was under their word limit. You can't turn in a long essay, they'll just throw it out. So we have to be eloquent, and then we have to adjust the manner of presentation to the venue. Now this takes wisdom, and you want that wisdom to be passionate and based on reason and solid facts. And we can be eloquent in any number of apologetic expressions. Informal arguments, give the Kalam cosmological argument, flesh out more of the aesthetic argument that I gave. This can be done honoring God, drawing attention to deeply human themes in fiction, in poetry, in dance, in theater, in opera, all these different venues. All right, let me move on now to the, apod the apologetic value of human art. Remember, there's divine art all around us. I want to talk about humanly constructed art. One element is looking at the history of art, we did that a bit with Gary, and contemporary art and asking what does this tell us about our culture? Where is our culture going? What does the music say about the culture's view of sexuality? What do the films say about our views of religion and philosophy? This is where you can understand art as a kind of social antenna. And media theorist Marshall McLuhan put it this way in Understanding Media, second edition, the power of the arts is to anticipate future social and technological developments by a generation and more, has long been recognized. In this century, Ezra Pound called the artist the antenna of the race. Art as radar acts as an early alarm system, as it were, enabling us to discover social and psychic targets in lots of time to prepare to cope with them. So what are the artists saying about their worldview, about the social situation? Now there's a lot of work to be done there. I came up as a young Christian apologist learning so much from the work of Francis Schaeffer in this regard, and also that of Hans Ruckmacher, uh, some of what they did was to look at modern art to show the dehumanization of humanity, to show fragmentation, nihilism, 
You can see this in some of the art of Picasso and so on. But it's not limited to a negative critique at all. Now, art can also elucidate biblical ideas in terms of showing what Christianity is. Some of the Dutch masters painted common scenes. Well, they all did. They painted common scenes in uncommon ways to draw your attention to the goodness and the beauty of the natural. And people may not discern that in a technologically cluttered world. Perhaps you go to an art museum and you see one of the Dutch masters or some other painter and you really see something about the created world that you had not seen, felt previously. Well, that might and should call your attention to a creator. The person who designed, let's say, the scene that is being painted, and all art doesn't have to be representational, but not just the scene, but the painter, the creator, and then the sub-creator, the artist. This can open up realms of discourse and meaning to people who may not sit down and read William Lane Craig or J.P. Moreland or Frank Beckwith, or Doug Grothuis, or Gary Dewey's. <laughs> Just to include everybody, or Sarah. No, everybody reads Sarah. I can't put her in there. So what I'm saying is that art can elucidate truth that we find propositionally stated in the scripture. Now, the scripture is the final word, certainly. But a biblical world and life view can inform and shape art, and it has in the music of Bach, and paintings of Rembrandt, and so much more. Now, these kind of aesthetic situations are not unspeakable mystical experiences. That is, we are not promoting someone sitting in front of a piece of art and going into a trance, and then coming out of the trance and saying, oh, it was so profound. People do this. In fact, there was a exhibition recently of uh, Modern Masters, I believe it was called, and they had some beautiful Mark Rothko paintings. And if you know Mark Rothko's work, later work, huge canvas, uh, in a sense a simplicity of horizontal lines, or it looks like they're blocks on top of each other, seemingly luminescent. It's not a representation of anything you would normally consider. And I went to this exhibit, and you can sit down in front of the artwork, and that's a significant thing to do, is sit still for a while and look at a work of art. And after that, I went out and experienced some other, some other great art at Pete's Kitchen, that is their omelets. <laughs> and two women had just been to this exhibit. And they seemed to be kind of refined people. Of course, they had good taste in food and so on. And the woman said, when I sat in front of that Mark Rothko, I just had this feeling. It was this mystical feeling. And that was it. Now, maybe someone could sit in front of a Mark Rothko and be transfixed by the beauty of it, the, the strange, compelling features, and think, gosh, maybe there's more to life than just matter and motion, time, space, chance. But... In this situation, I think it was sort of the hip thing to do to say that I sat in front of a Mark Rothko and got um, ineffable goosebumps. Well, that's not what I'm talking about. Now, I want to give an example of an artist from the 20th century, Georges Rouault, who died in 1958. And those of you that speak French know that I butchered it, but at least I didn't say Rouault. It could be worse. Now, Georges Rouault is a painter that cannot be classified as part of any school of painting. You couldn't call him a symbolist. You couldn't call him an impressionist. He was not an abstract expressionist. Perhaps you could call him an expressionist because he was trying to convey his response to the world as he experienced it as a loyal Roman Catholic. But when you look at his art, you think, and I know a fair amount about 20th century art, there's nothing I've seen that is really anything like this. It may a bit be a bit shocking to you. It may seem strange. 
But when I discovered Ruo, it was about 19, not 19, about 2011 or 12, and I was going through a really terrible, crushingly despairing time in life. And when I thought about these paintings, when I looked at them and I reflected on them, I realized that Georges Rouault captured an element of the human condition that I was experiencing in some sense, and that is lament. Sadness over a fallen world with a hope for redemption. You find this in, I think, almost, almost all of his figural paintings. The later part of his life, he tended to show more peaceful, happy people. He also painted landscapes and so on, but the art of his that I find the most compelling is where he depicts human beings, human figures. And I could overstate it, poetic overstatement, it's a lecture on art, and say that in some ways God used Georges Rouault to save my life during about a one or two year period because very few things consoled me, very few things seemed to speak to my situation. But these paintings did. So book fanatic that I am, I went on Amazon and got every single book in English that I could about Rouault or of his paintings. I haven't told my wife yet this, but I just did. You know, she's here. Now, he was not a French bohemian. He was a family man. He was a loyal Catholic. He did not represent the artist can do anything is a kind of prophet mentality or life. He was a quiet man. He was a man of steady faith. He did not talk about it all that much. He was an observant, orthodox Roman Catholic. And what you find is a unique, unrepeatable style emphasizing the impasto, mostly flat, not too much perspective in his paintings. They look something like stained glass windows. And he said, if I had any strong influence, or the strongest influence on my life was probably the church's stained glass windows. And he was, for a time, an apprentice in making stained glass windows. He painted landscapes. He painted religious scenes, John the Baptist's head on a platter. He painted scenes of the crucifixion and uh, Via Dolorosa and so on. He also painted clowns, judges, prostitutes. And he painted those in, those in distraught situations, in places where you wouldn't think of it. The unhappy old king the despairing clown who is supposed to make people happy. And what you see, and we'll see several of these in a moment, is that Georges Rouault painted, to use Pascal's language, the greatness and misery of the human situation. Pascal said in Ponce, what sort of a freak then is man? How novel, how monstrous, how chaotic. How paradoxical, how prodigious, judge of all things, feeble earthworm, repository of truth, sink of doubt and error, the glory and refuse of the universe. Let's look at one of his paintings of clowns. The first, there we go. That's not what I want, actually. The, um, the sad clowns. Can you get to that one? Technology does not like me. Never has. OK, three clowns. Now, I'm going to do something you're not supposed to do when you give a public lecture. I want to just let you look at that for a few minutes. Just look at it. Now, obviously, this is not photographic realism. 
there's no perspective in terms of three-dimensionality to it. It's flat. The background is indeterminate. It's abstract. We know that these are clowns because of how they're dressed. You notice also that the bodies are broken up into cubes, if you will, or sections. This was distinct of Rouault at a certain period in his painting career. Clowns are meant to distract people from their sadness and to elicit joy, hilarity, frivolity. But clowns may be deeply sad people. So here we have this sadness that is not simply in the face, but everything about this is sad. However, Rouault is not dehumanizing these clowns. He loves these clowns. You see much of 20th century art dehumanizing the subjects, fragmenting, scattering them, pouring acid over them. That's not Rouault, the Christian. You see sadness. You see a sense of irony that the clowns are so distraught. And then what else do you see? Consolation. Love among these three sad clowns. All right, let's take a look at the other one called The Clown with a Dog. It's even a little bit difficult to make out the dog because it's not carefully articulated. But you can tell it is by the gentle way that the clown is holding the dog. And the dog has that sense that dogs usually have of wanting to be close and show affection. And of course, you see that sense of the body divided up into sections without dehumanizing or fragmenting the body as the body. And here's a clown who's just done his show, making people laugh, diverting them from their misery. And he's backstage with his dog. Now, what does that tell us about the human condition? Humans, at their most despairing, at their least appealing in some ways, are valuable, objectively valuable creatures in the world. And consolation, if not total, some consolation is possible from other clowns and from a loyal dog. Okay, let's go to the old king, which was the first one that was put up there. I have a copy of this that's framed in my living room. It's one of my favorite of all the Ruos. It's a man of royalty. He's aged, he's not the young prince anymore. And you see the vestments of kingship, the ornamentation, the jewelry, Yet you see this sense of loss. It's not easy being a king all these years. But you still have dignity. He is a king. He's a human being. Now you don't have a carefully laid out representation of a human being. This is not photorealism. This is representational and figural. But there is a minimalism or a sense of maybe abstraction to it, which does not demean the characters. Let's just leave that one up there, please. Now, there's so much to say about the art of Rouault. When you pair him with the philosophical reflections of Blaise Pascal on the human condition, it becomes a profound presentation of the Christian message. Human beings created good, very good, called to exercise dominion, to develop the world under the lordship of God. And then the fall, 
human beings becoming estranged from God themselves, from nature, from other people, yet not losing the divine image. And the world is broken and wounded, but it is not worthless. It is not nothing. It is not garbage. You see this. I've only given you three. There are so many, black and whites, painted. I've only seen one Ruo face to face, and that was in the modern section of the Art Institute of Chicago in 2012. It was a very small painting simply called The Dwarf. Very unhappy looking man who has the features. It's only the head, the features of a dwarf. You might think, wait a minute. Isn't art supposed to be about what's beautiful? Shouldn't art be uplifting? Rouault thought that art needed to be more than beautiful. It needed to express some of the ugliness of the world, but in a respectful way. I won't show them to you. Some of you might be bothered, but Rue also painted prostitutes, sometimes nude prostitutes. There's nothing titillating about these depictions, zero. Why did he paint prostitutes? Not to condemn them. It was out of sympathy. He felt for their situation. So he painted them. It was for no pornographic purpose whatsoever. Now, in the Christian message, we can explain the greatness of humanity, that we are kings under God, but yet, as Pascal said, we are deposed kings. We're put here to have dominion, to develop creation, to reflect God to one another, and in a sense, reflect God back to God, being made in his image and likeness, and yet, the world is fallen and is broken and is full of sin. It's a both and. And Christ came as the perfect human being, God incarnate, living a righteous life without sin in thought, word, or deed to redeem these fallen yet majestic beings who could not possibly earn salvation, merit heaven, who can only be forgiven and restored from the top down, by the grace of God shown, shown in Christ, dying for us, that we could believe on him and have everlasting life. Pascal writes, Jesus is a God whom we can approach without pride and whom we can humble ourselves without despair. Jesus is a God whom we can approach without pride and before whom we can humble ourselves without despair. So we can't be prideful before the Creator, yet we're not thrown in despair because we retain the image of God, the Imago Dei, and moreover, human beings are redeemable through what Christ has done. The sad king, if he becomes a Christian, can know that he will not be sad forever that he can be redeemed. Or perhaps, just playing with this a little bit, he is a Christian, but he laments life in this very painful, lamentable world. And we can lament. We can take our sorrows to God, as the psalmist did, as the writer of Ecclesiastes did, and not be rejected by the Lord. Let me finish up by talking about art for the glory of God, extending his kingdom. We should heed the call to explain and defend Christianity in every dimension, to do this with competence, confidence, courage, compassion, and in art especially, creativity. Let's use every color on the apologist's palette to do this, to explain, defend, and commend Christianity. One way that I do this is by writing about jazz. There's a web page, and it's prestigious, I have to say, called All About Jazz. Gigantic page full of music reviews, concert reviews, essays about what is jazz in relation to culture. And most of my posts go under, what is jazz? I'm a philosopher, you know, I always ask, what is anything? So what is jazz? And if you go there and read any of my articles, 
Sometimes it's more obvious than others, but there is a subtle apologetic for Christianity in all those articles. I'm not twisting the arm of jazz to make it say Jesus. I'm not coercing an art form to make it say something it doesn't. But since we're made in God's image, and since artistic beauty comes from God, then when you look at an art form done well, whether it's painting, whether it's jazz, you see something of the goodness of creation which speaks to the goodness of the creator. So I want to be an excellent writer about jazz. Got a ways to go. I'm still learning. But I am not putting aside Christianity when I write about jazz. So I'm trying to find a creative expression of the Christian message that is faithful to the venue in which I'm working. I submitted a piece recently about observing Lent and going to a jazz nightclub at the same time. Just let you read it, if they publish it. I hope it was a uh, worthwhile reflection. So let's be creative and faithful people in explaining, defending, and commending this incomparable gift we've been given, the gospel, and the holy scriptures. Now what about this city, where we are? I started out by saying, where are we? We're in Denver. We're at an apologetics conference. It's a very artistic city, human art. The divine art that we see all around us, that we may enjoy so much. How do we engage this city faithfully, apologetically? I just have a few ideas and we'll take some questions. Engage the art scene. Do you have any way to do this? Go to the first Friday art walks on Santa Fe in the art district. Talk to the artists. The artists are usually the ones that are not looking at the paintings. <laughs> They're looking at what other people are looking at in their paintings. And I've had some terrific conversations with artists, and I've tried to develop some kind of a bridge to, for, well, actually, not even a bridge at first. Forget about the bridge for a minute. I want to understand their art, and I want to recognize them as human beings who are artists. So this is not some kind of a trick or maneuver to get in the gospel. I enjoy this. This is a gift. It's interesting. I don't like all the art. Maybe I have a lot to learn in that. You can make aesthetic mistakes. I said that earlier. But as you live a creaturely life of enjoying art and interacting with creators and artists, then it will, should naturally flow from you that you view this as a Christian. You are a follower of Jesus. And a lot of the art community are bohemian. They're not necessarily religious, or if they're religious, it's the wrong kind of religion. It's self-created religion. Now, if you just move to jazz for a minute, we have a professor here locally named Ron Miles, who's a trumpet player, composer. He's nationally known. And he's a professor at Metro State University. And he's a believer. He's a Christian. And I recently sent him an email and I said, would you be open to performing at Denver Seminary through our art outreach and talking a little bit about what jazz means to you as a Christian? And he said, I'd like to work on that. Now, I hope what might happen is that a lot of people that listen to Ron Miles would come, maybe not Christians that a lot of Christians who know nothing about jazz and say ignorant things about it would come and listen. Yeah, I'm a snob, I know, I can't hold it in. That's something we're working on. You can support local Christian artists. We have a remarkable artist here by the name of Zach Wild. He is a, he is a calligrapher par excellence. I've been in his home in his studio. And he does magical work in calligraphy. He's one of the best in the world. Well, we're going to have one of his displays at Denver Seminary, I think, next year. And I'm hoping all manner of people will come to that. Students will stop, forget about Greek for a little while, sorry, Craig, and, and look at these works of calligraphy. I can't even really describe how remarkable they are. I should have had a slide for him also. Support local artists. Moreover, 
Don't think the only way to be spiritual is to work in the church, be a missionary, or do some kind of quote-unquote full-time Christian ministry. We're all in full-time Christian ministry. We're trying to serve the Lord and love our fellow man and our fellow human beings. So that can be done as an artist. That can be done as a painter, a jazz musician. That can be done as a calligrapher. It can be done through dance, through acting. So we need to counsel people that you could be just as called to be a dancer for the glory of God as you could be called to be a pastor. You see, we need to have this broader, deeper sense of calling where you take your great joy and have it meet the world's deep hunger. I get that from Frederick Beekner. The art of apologetics. Let's consider aesthetic excellence, I think is broader than beauty, aesthetic excellence as evidence of God, the creator, and the designer. Let's consider the art of doing apologetics, the rhetoric of logos, ethos, pathos, Let's strive for elegance, eloquence, fitting the presentation to the venue. And then let's observe and really receive, just think, reflect on artworks. And we'll see, in some cases, only the misery of humanity, only the fallenness, really. In other cases, you'll only see what's bright, beautiful, and wonderful. I have to say it. Thomas Kincaid. Now, Thomas Kincaid is, was skilled technically, but in terms of his philosophy of art, he was trying to paint an unfallen world. The world is not unfallen. Georges Rouault. Let's use every color on the apologetics palette to defend and commend Christianity as objectively true, compellingly rational, and existentially meaningful and satisfying. Well, we have a little bit of time for questions and comments. Or do we? Ten minutes. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, what would you say to the person who may be, um, have made mistakes, have fallen in the trap of not very gracious um, apologetic conversations? Maybe he would haven't even prepared in the way of eloquence or of logos, pathos, and ethos. Someone who does not practice apologetic apologetics in a relationally wise way, is that what you're saying? I guess so. One who may have that sense of passion and duty, but at the same time um, may have spoken too quickly. Right. Well, it's often said that the besetting sin of the apologist is arrogance. Because when you know there are so many good arguments for Christianity and so many arguments against it are bad, hollow, and shallow, you can jump on people. And we need to exercise speaking the truth in love to our fellow believers and to everyone. And you learn through failing. I think it's better to do apologetics badly than not to do it at all. But if you do it badly, eventually to realize you're doing it badly and reform. So someone might have logos and, no, and pathos but no ethos because they're impetuous, they interrupt people, uh, they're arrogant, they sort of have this gotcha thing going. I have a student right now that does that to me. I don't know what's going on. Gotcha. <laughs> Grotheis didn't know something. I know it surprised him. But uh, practice prayer and then be accountable to people. Let's say you're talking to a few non-Christians in a group and then somebody is way too belligerent and obnoxious and you can say, well, you know, John, I know you have a heart for God. You had good arguments, but you're obnoxious. And you need to tone down a little bit. Schaefer used to say this to his workers at Labrie, their retreat center, study center in the Swiss Alps. If you're really winning an argument with an unbeliever and they look like they're humiliated, then back off. We're not here to bludgeon people. This is not a game. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Uh, just to add one thing to that, a good reflection for all of us on a regular basis is to read 1 Corinthians 13 about what love is. Love is patient and kind. It's not arrogant or boastful. It puts other people first. Love uh, abides and so on. And then reflect on your own life in any area, your marriage, your parenting, apologetics, politics, oh boy, politics, you should be loving in politics. It's a novel idea now. Yes, sir. Yeah, thanks. Um, I wonder if you could say a few more words about uh, how we can avoid collapsing um, an objective standard of beauty into just tastes. And then also um, a word about how we can encourage more logos in the church. I feel like there's a, a strain of anti-intellectualism oh, in yes, the church. Oh, yes, there is. Well, when you talk about aesthetic judgment and taste, you're not doing mathematics. It's somewhat difficult to develop the art of taste. I like what T.S. Eliot said, that we need an educated taste. We could like things that we shouldn't like. We could dislike things uh, that we should like and appreciate. I think we do this by looking at the history of art, by reading books about art. I love Schaefer's little book, Art and the Bible. First part, art as presented in the Bible. Second, some principles of art evaluation for the Christian. That will get you a long way. But we need to say, look, if we're not relativists in morality, why are we relativists about art? It's a way to start. Again, book one, or chapter one, Abolition of Man. The waterfall is sublime, not pretty. That's a teaser for everybody. I want everybody to feel guilty having read The Abolition of Man. It's only 100 pages. I've read it about 15 times. Yes? Um, as Dr. Ruiz uh, mentioned in his presentation, historically Christians have been the source of great art movements and technique and um, historically, but now there seems to be a, have been a shift in that where uh, Christian art, whether it be music or painting or movies, um, seems to mimic culture or um, yeah. sort of copy and not be as good. So what would you say is maybe, like why did, why did that happen? What can we do to combat that? Mm, big question, excellent question. Uh, Christians have been some of the greatest artists in history and that's not apart from their worldview. It's a beautiful world. Uh, the human figure is worth painting and reflecting on, and language is worth using in poetry and so on. So the Christian should be motivated to live an artistically enriched life, whatever your gifts and skills are. So I think we need teaching on that. And it's such a deep question, but let me just take one area of it. A lot of American evangelicalism comes out of revivalism, especially the, uh, what's called the Second Great Awakening. And for all the good that did and for all the people who came into the kingdom, it tended to be anti-intellectual, at least parts of it, and very pragmatic. Let's get souls into the church, get souls into the church. So with Finney, who is the worst of it, Charles Finney, who is in fact a Pelagian, Finney said there are these measures you can use to get people to come up to the altar and be saved. It's like a kind of sacred mechanism you put in place. And this has to do with playing on the emotions to get people saved. Now that, you don't want to play on anybody's emotions. You want to live an aesthetically enriched, godly kind of life that embraces the world in a spirit-led way. So art is good in and of itself as part of creation. And when you make art a vehicle for something else, then you can undermine the very nature of art. It becomes propaganda. I think a lot of Christian art, there are great counterexamples to this now, but it's basically, let's be religious and try to impress people with certain emotions, and we know what they already like in popular culture, so let's use that to the end of trying to get them to become Christians, or let's use it to the end of building up the Christian in what they already like from popular culture. Terrible theology of culture. One could go on. But let me give you an example of a great counter to this, and that's uh, Meiko Fujimura, 
who is a Japanese-American painter. And he's developed his own style of painting. And he has been well-received in the art world, in the New York art scene where he's ministered. He has a very rich philosophy and theology of art. He doesn't say, I do Christian art. He's an artist. It comes out of his ethnicity as elements of Japanese art. He's been influenced somewhat by abstract expressionism. But he's sort of like Rouault. You can't pigeonhole him. And his art doesn't come out and just obviously say Christianity is true. But it shows themes of creation and themes of the human condition that help explain or at least help vivify what it's like to live in God's world in Christianity. Are we done? That's one more. Could you address a kind of a corollary question of the role of art in worship and in spiritual maturity in the church? No. <laughs> I can't. I didn't get to the anti-intellectual part of that last question. The answer is read all of the books by all the speakers. That'll take care of anti-intellectual very, very quickly. Uh, develop your reading life, please. I think that the key thing here is that worship needs to be focused on God, saying things about God, not necessarily about our feelings, or putting our feelings in the context of the living God. And then moreover, the church needs to be its own culture. This is why I'm an Anglican. And Frank, the road stops at Canterbury. <laughs> but it's kind of an inside joke. Yeah. <laughs> but the church needs to be its own culture. We need to learn how to pray, learn how to worship, learn how to confess our sins, learn how to show reverence. So we need to develop sacred habits in the culture of the church. And people say, oh, that's irrelevant. You won't reach anybody. Wrong. This honors God. And many people, many millennials, Sarah said, want a richer, deeper experience in the church. And if this is based on the gospel and the tradition of divine liturgy, then it's just good in and of itself. And it's a way that God brings people to realize these sacred realities by symbols, by actions, by confession. So I think that's the key thing. The church, the life of the church needs to be a sacred tradition in and of itself and not simply copy popular culture. And in Rod Dreher's book, which I, I don't agree with everything in it, I don't agree with everything that I've written actually, but it's an, ac it's an excellent book. And the chapter on liturgy is profound. It's, I think, the best short defense of liturgy that I've read. All right, folks, thank you very much.